we have one of our reigning supreme guests that has been with us since the very beginning. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we're going to bring in um, the new CEO of your part-time controller, one of our valued and one of our very first um, corporate sponsors, to talk about fraud. And it is, it's something that we can't be fooled by. And so we were like, we got to put you on April Fool's Day because this is a big deal. So uh, we are thrilled you're here. We're also thrilled that we have our amazing sponsors with us. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, first and foremost, Jennifer, there were times in the very beginning of the nonprofit show where you, working from the East, were on your phone, you were on our live program, you were monitoring what Congress was voting on because that would impact the nonprofit sector. You were with us when things were crazily changing, yes. amazing, and you were a, a senior leader, yeah. number two. Now you're numero uno. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you so much. Starting March 1st and my new title as CEO. Well, talk to us here. <laughs> I know it does. The, the payroll, the spreadsheet, <laughs> the taxes. Talk to us about what YPTC does first and foremost. Um, yes. In terms of also what you do and the ecosystem mm -hmm. that you're now leading. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's so great to be here, uh, Julia, with you again. And yes, can you believe it's been four years since COVID and the first time I was on the nonprofit show and we were in the heat of it, as you said, um, helping nonprofits get informed about PPP. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, we've just loved partnering with you uh, and the nonprofit show um, to let nonprofits know about proper financial management. And uh, we're just so happy to be part of it. And I'm really happy to be here today. A um, little bit about your part-time controller. We provide financial management to nonprofit organizations, and we serve close to 2,000, believe it or not, nonprofits of all shapes and sizes throughout the United States. We help organizations with their bookkeeping, month-end close. I mentioned that in the beginning. <laughs> it's April 1st. It's time to close the books. Financial reporting, analysis, budgeting, and forecasting, audit preparation and readiness, and so much more. Um, mainly what we like to say is we help executive directors and board members sleep at night by knowing that their financial management is taken care of. Um, but organizations call us in times of need. Um, sometimes they're worried about fraud happening in their organizations and they would have, they would love to have a second set of eyes mm -hmm. on their books um, and help them get on the right track with best practices of, um, and processes uh, for proper internal controls. You so. know, it, it's got to be uh, when you're in the thick of it and you're yeah. operating and managing, uh, whether you're a board member or you're, you know, on the, the paid staff, you really kind of only know what you know. You only know your environment. But when you partner with somebody like YPTC, you bring like a whole arc of all mm -hmm. these other experiences and knowledge that I feel like you can prevent somebody from falling into the abyss of fraud. And so I've got to ask you about, to start with this point, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are shocked that fraud happens in nonprofits, but it happens. Uh, it happens too often. Uh, and you think, oh, nonprofit organizations, how would somebody hurt a nonprofit organization? And th the most vulnerable of um, constituents oftentimes uh, that are being hurt. Um, and But it happens often. And I think the vulnerable part is the important uh, phrase there uh, because organizations... Um, think that they might not be at risk, nonprofit organizations, uh, because they are doing good for the world and they're helping others and that fraudsters wouldn't prey on them. But unfortunately, it happens both from outside um, environmental issues, such as cyber risks, but also there's often an inside job where, believe it or not, 
there's um, bad characters that actually work for nonprofit organizations. So um, I'm glad you brought the board. Um, we talked about board um, uh, management and oversight up because that's a really, really important part of a nonprofit's function. Uh, board members have to know what's going on. And that's what you, you were mentioning that we help board members understand what's going on in the organization. But um, I'm going to start out with a story about how, what board members need to be asking about. Right? Yeah, because I think a lot of times yeah. people are like, oh, I'm just a board member. This is, you know, I would feel bad, but this isn't going to really impact me. And I think you're going to tell us not so fast. Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, rip from the headlines, right? The old law and order. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I had to know. Um, <laughs> the Washington. The Washington Post, this is recently, I think just uh, in the past month, reported a story of a founder of a DC nonprofit that serves LGBTQ youths. Um, of course, um, homelessness um, is their issue. And can you imagine they are the most, some of the most vulnerable kids out there. Um, and this actually, unfortunately, was an inside job and something where, uh, in a situation where the board missed the mark. So um this organization the executive director executive director fraudulently obtained funds from government supported loan programs and diverted these funds to her bank account located outside the united states oh. as well as stole from the organizations in other ways like giving herself an unapproved raise so all told it was over a hundred uh, I'm sorry, $800,000, $800,000 uh, in loss to the organizations. Um, so there are a lot of red flags. Um, before this was even uncovered, all of the losses were even uncovered. Num number one, the organization was paying workers less than minimum wage and also not paying workers all the wages that they had earned. So you got to think that the board, unfortunately, was asleep at the wheel with this one, the organization is now in receivership and the receiver is suing the board for improper oversight. So board members actually have some legal responsibilities as well as very specific fiduciary duties that include a duty of care and financial oversight. So uh, I won't go into all of the all of the duties of care and financial oversight, um, go to YPTC.com to learn more. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have done several web webinars uh, associated with board members' responsibilities and fraud. So check them out. We have a ton of resources on our website. But here's, I have a few quick tips for mm -hmm. board members. Uh, first of all, uh, as it relates to their financial management responsibilities, for sure, first of all, make sure that the individuals working in the financial management of the organization have proper financial management experience. It's really just a basic, yeah. <laughs> basic um, issue. I mean, making sure that the financial management, um, people working in financial management have that experience. I mean, that just seems such a um, baseline. But it's important that board members question who is doing the bookkeeping, the financial reporting, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to make sure, it, I think YPTC comes in a lot of times when there's not that individual or team uh, that has the proper experience. A lot of times the nonprofit's really small yeah. and they have what we call the accidental bookkeeper Mm -hmm. uh, that, yes. Hey, you're pretty smart. You can do a lot of things. You can handle the QuickBooks. And oftentimes that's perfectly fine for a nonprofit that's a small in size. Um, but after, after a while, you need to get financial reports. Um, you need to have analysis. You need to have um, budgeting, forecasting. And a lot more is to the financial management than just keeping the QuickBooks. So just make sure that you have the proper people doing the financial management in your organizations. You know, yeah. I think it's interesting okay. that you, I think that's like logical and I don't think we talk about it enough, but I really like that you linked that back to the board 
that the board needs to be asking that question. And I, so I want to amplify that a little bit because I think a lot of times it's kind of a mysterious thing. I, I always say, you know, that accounting finance team, they're in the back, they're in the corner and, and there isn't that engagement piece that the board really should be demanding. So I'm thrilled that you brought that up. So I interrupted you. Sorry. No, that's okay. A board member, a board members should, well, a board should absolutely have a finance uh, committee and the members of the financial management team of the organization should be attending those committee meetings, presenting financials. It shouldn't just be the executive director attending those meetings. The board, and that's one of my other top um, uh, requirements for board members to do is require the organization to be producing monthly financial reports. I can't tell you how often we start with an organization that is not producing monthly financial reports. And it's not just the production of those reports, but they have to be timely. Um, soon after the month end is closed, um, within two weeks, the okay. management and board members should have the financial reports. They need to be accurate. The board and management need to be able to rely on those financial reports, and they need to be in a format that's understandable for both management and the board. And if they're not, then the board member is required to ask questions and find out why are these uh, financial reports not understandable? Why can't I make heads or tails of them? And oftentimes what it is, is the board member is intimidated by financial management. They say, I'm not a financial management expert. I don't have that kind of background and experience. So who am I to ask these questions? Well, I am saying you are responsible for asking those questions. And oftentimes it's those individuals that don't have um, the financial management experience that um, do ask the right questions and get to the bottom of problems uh, before they become a gigantic issue for an organization. So don't be intimidated to ask questions. Um, here's some questions that the board members should ask. Um, of course, what is the background and experience of those in your financial area? Yeah. How do bills get paid? Who has that authority? And side note, if you're not using an electronic bill pay system at this point, and there are uh, paper checks being used, um, it's time to really ask that question and to change that because not only is the uh, an electronic bill pay system way more efficient than check signing, it also is stronger for internal controls of those checks and balances of the organizations. Um, you should be asking how often financials are produced. And we just answered that question. The answer should always be monthly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another good question for board members to be asking regularly, who is responsible for reconciling the bank accounts? Are they being reviewed? I always recommend that the executive director um, at least discuss what's happening with these bank accounts and put, I would say not necessarily every month, but regularly, put eyeballs on those bank reconciliations and understand what is happening so that the executive director can report to the board, indeed, bank reconciliations are being happen are happening and appropriately monthly. And that's, again, where YPTC comes in. Uh, oftentimes, we're the outside party uh, putting together the bank reconciliations because it should never be the person uh, performing the bank reconciliations that has authority to send money out, whether electronically they're pressing the button to send the funds out directly to vendors and others uh, or signing checks. Smart. Uh, I'm, I'm for glad, hours about this. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I have a quick uh question about this is that mm -hmm. it seems like from COVID, um, a lot of boards have moved to moved away from monthly meetings to quarterly meetings or meeting on, on a Zoom type of platform, right? Mm -hmm. They're not IRL, mm -hmm. not in real mm -hmm. life. And mm -hmm. it seems to me like that's a great opportunity for an organization to say, yeah, we don't need to be doing this every month. We can kind of Mm -hmm. hurry up and get it all done before mm -hmm. the board meeting. How yeah. do we navigate so that our boards are saying, yeah, we might not be meeting together, but this still needs 
to come to us monthly. How yeah. do you reconcile that to use an accounting term? Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, as I mentioned before, finance committee, uh, because boards can delegate, they shouldn't, full board should not be delegating all financial responsibility to the finance committee. Every board member has responsibility for the finances of the organization. But if you have a strong finance committee, the finance committee could be meeting monthly, reviewing the financials with um, the executive director and the individual, whether it's YPTC or uh, someone on the team doing the accounting, uh, to look at those monthly financial reports and then reporting up to the board on a quarterly basis. But I would also still recommend bringing the person in charge of financial management to every board meeting because it should be absolutely a part of every board agenda that uh, they discussed financial management. Okay. Thank you. Cause I, you know, I, I just is like one of those trends I'm seeing and I don't know if you and your folks are seeing it, but you know, pulling out that time in between meetings. And then I, to me, this is like kind of one of those reasons why things can fall through the cracks. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the other thing on this April Fool's Day that uh, you should not be fooled with is uh, cyber risks. I know you've had a lot of guests on your show and probably guests that have a lot more knowledge and experience about cybersecurity than I do, but I certainly have seen and we have seen our share of cyber frauds um, hitting our nonprofit organizations. And I will tell you this, nonprofit, or I'm sorry, cyber criminals don't care if you're a nonprofit. <laughs> they, and again, they, they look for these vulnerabilities of individuals and they think, oh, it's a nonprofit. Maybe they um, are going to uh, be more vulnerable and we can hit them. And, and, you know, cyber could really cause a lot of damage. Cyber um, security breaches can really cause a lot of damage at a nonprofit organization, whether it's financial loss, reputational damage, legal liabilities, and um, very specifically disruption. Because if you have a cyber attack, your regular business is not being attended to. You are going to be focusing on that issue. Um, yeah. Don't think it's not going to happen to you. Don't be the fool. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, phishing's the worst one. And we're still seeing it mm -hmm. so often um, with AI emails. And everybody knows what phishing is, right? It's, it's uh, malicious emails that are intended to trick the reader into revealing personal information or um, deploying malicious software and often asking the recipient for money or send gift cards. And with AI, these emails are looking more and more real. I mean, I, I shouldn't be surprised, but I am always surprised when I hear about a person um, getting fooled, um, entering credentials into this fake email and even senior managers I see doing this. Um, but Again, it's preying on your vulnerabilities is when we're tired and stressed and um, we let our guards down and that's what the fraudsters are waiting for. So amazing. Yeah. And I think that that is um, I I'm glad you brought that up because I think a lot of times we're we're just trying to get through our emails so fast. It's coming in that way. And we're, you know, maybe standing in line for coffee and we're just trying to kind of make life easier, supposedly. And then these things just, uh, you know, snowball. snowball. And I will tell you, when people are looking at emails on their phone, I think they're more at risk because, yeah. uh, especially us, you know, maybe I didn't have my glasses on. I am in wait, I'm waiting for coffee. And I'm like, oh. oh, let me just go on this. Oh, Microsoft is asking me, it, so it sounds like it's coming from my IT department that I have to re-enter my credentials and... Um, or I'm you know, going to get shut down my, all my accounts. Well, oh, of course I have to answer that. No, obviously you want to stop and think about that one. Um, the bank, um, even your boss, it's coming from your boss. And a lot of people now that I'm CEO are saying, I'm getting a lot of these fake emails from you, Jen, asking me to do a, you a special favor. I'm like, uh, yeah, I promise you, I will not be sending you an email to say, send money somewhere. So don't ever oh, think. Jennifer. Obviously, people get caught in that, even though it sounds so ridiculous. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. Well, you, you know, I think you got to start with what is it that's going on and how does the ecosystem like work because it's changing so rapidly, but what are some basic things that we can be doing to prevent fraud? Cause it seems to me from talking to folks around this world every day in the nonprofit, in the NGO space, mm -hmm. they never address this until they've had a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even with all the AI that's happening, the deep fakes, you know, whoever thought deep fake would be a thing. Uh, now, not only can you get uh, preyed upon in your email, you potentially could get preyed upon in uh, a video conference call. Recently, The Guardian reported that there was a $25 million fraud uh, from a bookkeeper who was faked out by a um, on a video call uh, by AI. It wasn't an actual person she was talking to. Is that crazy? So how do people prevent fraud? Well, first of all, top-down approach. You, you have to have a proper tone at the top. The board and the executive management team needs to set the tone that we will not... Um, we are going to be an organization uh, that is going to have strong internal controls, uh, be uh, ethical in all things that we do. So we want to have that top down. That means we're hiring the right people. We're doing proper background checks on everyone. Um, most importantly, those individuals that are working in the financial management area and also um, and even board members. Um, I have a, a story that, or saw a story in the news that um, uh, board members had joined uh, this board in Washington, D.C., but were already in the middle of a um, fraud case that they were being convicted of fraud at their previous nonprofit, and the organization that they joined did not conduct background checks. So uh, here you have a board member that has a uh, is a convicted felon on on your board. You can't you can't be having that. So tone at the top, background checks so important. Um, also the checks and balances uh, typical in any that you should have are uh, as I mentioned before bank reconciliation, closing the books every month, and issuing monthly financial reports that have comparisons to your budget and to prior year, and looking at those variances. Why do you have a variance to budget? Why do you have a variance to prior year? Oftentimes, um, not only that there's errors in the financials, there might be something that pops out at you um, that is um, going to unravel as as potential problem. Um, as <laughs> as well as being, you know, just really good practice to understand, you know, we set this plan in the beginning of a budget and 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 where are we? Now, right. It seems to me like a lot of times with these things, we wait too long and then it's like, well, that was a miss. We'll do better next year. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> so which is just like the absolutely the wrong strategy to take versus saying, OK, here's a problem that might become a trend that might become problematic. It's it's just um, a good structure of management. And I think you made this comment in the very beginning of today's show, and that is people are intimidated to ask questions or to challenge something like this. And so I, I see how it just kind of perpetuates, you know, it's a really interesting thing and it, it's so problematic. We don't have a lot of time left, but I, I didn't want to let you go today without talking about the value of strong internal controls. Um, what does that look like for the for any size of nonprofit? And has that not one person in the organization has the power, has okay. the power to um, approve purchases, approve vendors. Vendor approval is so important. Um, and also send money uh, directly to to vendors and others and uh, be reconciling the bank accounts. So um, it's just not giving one person all of that power. And even at a small organization, it's it's okay to have a few, well, I shouldn't say it's okay. 
even in a small organization, you want to separate those duties. And there's a there's a way to do that. You can get your board treasurer involved. You certainly can get the executive director involved uh, in making sure that there are the proper checks and balances, uh, that not one person can be doing it all. Such, such words of wisdom. And I think it's... Um a new dawn for understanding these things because we have become so digitally uh, oriented and there's all this fintech and we need to be looking at the way we navigate things in a, in a, in a new way that I personally believe is a better way, right? You know, that yes. there's, there's more opportunity for everybody. It's not just a function of fraud, but you know, that we, we can be more significantly managing our organizations right? And for I completely agree. And with the dawn of electronic payments, um, obviously payroll, we've been doing electronically for years and years and years. AP, accounts payable, has just really caught on since COVID uh, as far as um, uh, especially nonprofits paying their bills uh, in electronic workflow, way like uh, a bill or uh, Intuit is uh, now um, starting to have their own uh, Intuit is QuickBooks, QuickBooks yeah. Online, uh, and starting to have their own AP workflow as well. Um, that gives you a ample opportunities to set up um, processes in which vendors are properly vetted and approved or getting W-9s from vendors, making sure that they're real, um, and also making sure that there's someone that is in the books setting everything up, but then there's a workflow for approvals of all those payments. It also, as you mentioned, gives everyone an opportunity to get involved, program managers, um, directors of development and such, each should have their own separate budget and be responsible for approving their to you know, to a certain dollar amount uh, to, <laughs> that you set up, uh, approving their own payments, and then ultimately, um, someone who's not doing the bank reconciliations should be the one sending um, and approving finally and sending the money out. I love it. You know, I think that this is just um, has been a fascinating conversation with you today, and you know, I think it it is um, a conversation that. It just helps the overall health of an organization. This is one of those things that you need to be thinking about so you can grow and that you don't move backwards and that you're always, you know, trying to stumble over solutions versus being proactive and being, you know, uh, marching towards your mission and the things that you want to do. And so these structural issues, um, I think they've never been more important. Fraud aside, Fraud might be the reason why a lot of people make changes, but ultimately, Jennifer, it seems to me like this is just inherent good business. It's right? good business for nonprofits. Nonprofits don't often think of themselves as a business, but they are. The I can, uh, nonprofits are public institutions. All of their information on a 990 is public information. And um, the press is very interested in uh, understanding if nonprofits and, and also all of the charity watchdogs are very interested in ensuring that nonprofits have proper financial management. And honestly, it's a good thing because donors want to know that an organization is properly managed and, and well run. Right. Well, Jennifer Levis, CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Your Part-Time Controller, one of our very first um, go-to people when we started the nonprofit show um, at the onset of the COVID pandemic. Um, wow, it has been such a joy to see your organization grow. It has been such a joy to see you grow and to see this team. I refer you and your people all the time uh, to nonprofit leaders throughout the country. So I know it's working. I know from the people that I engage with or interface with that your team members have really brought forward a lot of great ideas and, and solutions. And so it's just been a joy to have you, even though it is April fool's day, we're not, as you said, being fool, we're not fooling around with this topic. Not <laughs> Let's not fool around. Um, 
again, we're we're so happy to be part of the nonprofit show, and uh, uh, I hope everyone that's uh, watching today uh, visits our website yptc.com um, and checks us out when we're on the show. I know we're having another fraud episode in August, and also check out our Mission Business podcast. Uh, Julia Patrick is going to be a guest uh, oh. upcoming uh, in the next few months. I think I'm, we're doing our interview in the next few weeks. But I think I'm, so. I think yes. so. No, I'm, it, your content is amazing. And, and um, I'll just say this quickly. You don't have to be a client of YPTC to get access to this amazing information. So um, I think that's really um, a valiant effort because it always seems like you all are always trying to elevate you know, our sector and elevate the conversation. And, um, and that's really powerful. But uh, anyway, the new CEO of your part-time controller, Jennifer Leva, we are delighted that you've joined us today. We are also delighted to say thank you to all of our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, your part-time controller, Woohoo! <laughs> 180 <laughs> Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. You know, these people join us in our sector every day to make things more achievable when it comes to our mission, vision, and values. So check them out. They really do support our sector. Um, all right. You know, every day we end with this mantra. Um and we have from the very beginning. And I was thinking, oh, I'll do a really funny little, you know, April Fool's joke. And, I, and then I was like, no, I can't do that. I have to I have to say the mantra because I truly yes. believe it. <laughs> and it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Jen, thank you so much. We're so proud of you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.